everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is my first book, so uh, this is a real pleasure for me to be here and share um, what I learned during my three years working on uh, the issue of sex and sexual assault on campus. So the book is about the new rules of sex um, that are mostly being implemented at universities through the nation. It's about ethical sex. It's about being compassionate to your partner, sex that is thoughtful, that leaves the other person feeling more self-esteem instead of less self-esteem. We all grew up in a country that didn't really promote that, um, but right now, these rules are really changing and college students are at the forefront. So I started this book in the summer of 2014 um, when I decided to write an article about sexual assault on Columbia University's campus. Um, I went and interviewed a few different students up there um, who were very angry about the way that Columbia had treated them. And I'm sure you've all read the stories in the newspapers of universities really um, abrogating their responsibilities to survivors. Um, and this was happening at Columbia's campus. It's perhaps not happening as often as you think from reading the news because universities are not able to speak publicly about individual cases due to federal privacy regulations. So a lot of the times we only really hear one side of the story. I do believe that universities are getting better at this all the time. Um, but in the summer of 2014, it was clear that Columbia was at least being very slow about processing cases um, and not taking all of the claims that seriously. So I spoke to diff some different students I um, set up an interview with Emma Solkowitz uh, at French Roast, which is a great cafe in Greenwich Village in Manhattan, um, one of the casualties of the um, recent uh, rapacious takeover of Manhattan by uh, big box, I mean, not big box, but like, you know, fancy chain stores of ridiculous um, pieces of clothing that nobody needs. Um, so we sat in this really storied cafe in Greenwich Village and talked about her story, talked about what she said happened to her. And while we were talking, she said, listen, let me tell you something. I have this mattress. I'm going to do this art project. I am going to carry this mattress around until Columbia expels the boy who raped me or until graduation. And I said, wow. That's a crazy but kind of brilliant idea. Like, you know, give me a call when you do that. I would like to see that. I think that might be really interesting. Yeah, okay, I'd like to see it. Little did I know that, you know, the moment she began doing this, it was going to be everywhere from Vice to MTV to Al Jazeera to newspapers all over the world. Um, this was the viral story, right, of 2014 of the fall was Emma carrying her mattress around Columbia. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you um, are aware of it. So I wrote this New York Magazine story and it's entitled A Very Different Kind of Sexual Revolution on Campus. So what's the problem with sexual assault? Um, women don't speak about it and men don't see it. Women are uh, maybe ashamed they feel like they might have brought it on themselves. It might be my fault. Um, so they're silent. And men don't see it either because they uh, are afraid to acknowledge that it exists because they might be complicit in it or because of male privilege, right? Which is, this is pretty good what I got going here. I don't want to think of myself as somebody who participates in non-consensual sex. I just want to have fun. So you were really drunk. You still had will, right? I mean, what's the big deal? It's a learning experience. So OK, we won't do it that way next time. So I started my reporting at Columbia. Um, and the group of students who I reported with were 
part of a group that they had named No Red Tape. And that was about these cases that they were bringing to Columbia. And they felt that the university was being slow, it was making them fill out too many forms, it was telling them, hey, you need to do one interview, now you need to do another interview. Um, oh, I'm really sorry, you went home for summer break and you have an internship, but if you don't do this interview on Friday morning at 11 o'clock, we're gonna close your case. Um, so this is a statue of alma mater, um, which is the, if anybody's been to Columbia uh, in Morningside Heights in New York, um, it's a beautiful campus. Um, and this statue, which is eight feet tall and was created by Daniel Chester French, um, who also did the Lincoln Memorial, um, is the focal point of the campus. It's in the middle. It's on the steps of Lowe Library, which is the grand bu grandest building on Columbia's campus. And this is um, Athena in the garb of alma mater. Um, and so, these students were very um, adept at organizing and direct action, uh, began to silence the university, right? It's also a symbol of the way that they felt that they were silenced. Um, so this became one of their tropes. This is an early um, rally. Um, a lot of students were really angry that the academic deans were in the chain of decision um, on their sexual assault cases. So a lot of other students started taking out um, their own mattresses. So this is the type of mattress that Columbia gives to its students. It's shiny and blue. Um, it's bed bug proof. It's over six feet um, because they know they have a lot of growing boys who might be, you know, six five or something like that. They gotta give them a nice long mattress, an extra tall mattress. Um, so students were taking them out um, these are actually some mattresses that were donated by Ultraviolet, which is um, a very effective um, feminist group. Um, and in this rally, uh, which was pretty amazing, um, each student group was given a mattress to carry to that Athena sculpture across the campus. Um, so it was groups from Justice, and pa Justice for Palestine, um, to the queer group, to even the swing group, and they used the um, red tape to write their names on the mattress. So this is um, the essential message, right, of this moment of anti-rape activism. It is don't rape, not don't get raped. We're not gonna talk about what women need to stop doing, we're gonna talk about what men are doing, right? Um, this is this enormous rally once again. So at the end of this rally, all the students walked across campus um, holding their mattresses up high. It was a very rainy day. Some of them put some, uh, you know, some, they, they had pieces of plastic that they put over their mattresses. They were, you know, chanting no justice, no peace. They went to Columbia President's um, beautiful home on the top of Morningside Heights. And then they said, everybody dump their mattresses in the front lawn but because they were so organized, they actually stacked their mattresses. So these are organized people. So where did this all come from? Um, Title IX, as some of you probably know, um, it's a statute from 1972. It says, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So if you are a university and you get federal financial assistance, which we all know that they all do, no discrimination on the basis of gender. So this was um, signed into law by Richard Nixon. He was at the time um, trying to sign uh, into law a court order uh, to, uh, to postpone court orders that integrated schools by busing. That's actually what he was after. But uh, he was willing to give this one a pass and he might have thought, what's the big deal? But we all know that it protected um, women's sports teams, right? That they needed to have as much equipment as guys do, as facilities be as good as guys, um, and also protects students from sexual harassment. And um, over the years, sexual harassment, of course, included sexual assault. That's part of it. 
So the government began to tell universities that that was its responsibility too. But Obama in 2011 certainly um, broadened what universities needed to do to keep students safe. He emboldened the Office for Civil Rights, which is the office that deals with discrimination, right? Transgender bathrooms, sexual assault on campus. Um, he wrote a Dear Colleague letter, which had a lot of strong suggestions for colleges about how to protect students um, from being victimized. Joe Biden, of course, was his partner in this. Um, somewhat controversial figure in some circles. Uh, some people feel he's a bit too handsy, um, both with women and men. But he did make this one of his priorities. Um, he was instrumental in passing the Violence Against Women Act. He also did um, help Clarence Thomas get on the Supreme Court. So complicated figure. Um, but nothing really would have happened here, right? if it wasn't for the students themselves. So this is a picture of an activist from Know Your Nine, and she's going to, she's gone to DC to deliver a petition. These young activists, primarily at um, small universities on the East Coast, so Yale, Amherst, Tufts, they began to talk to each other through the internet, and they began to understand exactly what their rights were on campus. And they began to understand what Obama was willing to say their rights were on campus, and then start holding the university's feet to the fire and say, the Office for Civil Rights says that we deserve this. You need to give it to us. So how did they do this? Mostly they did it through the media, right? Um, these are two women from End Rape on Campus, which is another very effective activist group. They are both uh, students, uh, graduates of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, they are two of the most effective behind the scenes power brokers. They're also the protagonists of The Hunting Ground, if anybody saw that. Um, so they're sitting here in front of a map. And on the map, there are a bunch of dots. And those dots represent universities that they were actively pursuing. How were they pursuing them? Either they were reaching out to people, students who were writing in campus newspapers, I was sexually assaulted. I want to tell my story. Here's my real name. I'm telling my story. These activists were reaching out to them and saying, we want to hear your story. And we know a media reporter who wants to hear your story too, right? They were also helping those students from schools across the country. So here we have a slide of Ohio State, Michigan, Cal, 55 schools under investigation for sexual assault, right? That's called a Title IX complaint. Young activists, these national young activists, were helping students to write these federal complaints and send them to the Office for Civil Rights. There are now 300 schools that are under federal investigation for sexual assault. So those made really nice headlines too, right? So when I started my um, research, I decided to go back to my own alma mater, um, Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, which um, some people may have heard of and some people may <laughs> only kind of vaguely know what it is and think it's a women's university from, um, you know, where Hillary Clinton went. Um, it's not. It's a small, um, very, very radical university. And um, I went back there 20 years after I graduated, and I began talking to students about not only sexual assault, but also consensual sex. Because a lot of my book is about, again, ethical sex, where the boundaries should be. Um, I'm not that interested in the scary, scary predator stories. I'm really interested in how do we come up with a fair standard so that everybody feels better about their sexual assault, their sexual experiences in college. How can we redefine this as positive instead of, you know, friends of mine 20 years after they graduated telling me stories 
that have never really left their consciousness, right? I mean, we all know that this is happening a lot. So, okay, I'm gonna read a little bit when I can find my page here. <laughs> um, so, when I went back to Wesleyan, youth culture's 20-year nostalgia cycle was coming back around. The school was awash in Doc Martin's boots, velvet chokers, Converse high tops, plaid flannel shirts, and shoulder-slung mini backpacks. Sonic youth patches were no longer sewn to the backpack's front pockets. Instead, since plastic water bottles are now banned here, these pockets often dangle a carabinered steel canteen. Not only do these students look the same, they also talk urgently about many of the same issues, in particular sexual assault. Debates about what is consensual and what is not, what type of sex is ethical and what is immoral, are essential to life here today. There's a difference between illegal and unethical, one student told me. Life is not about doing whatever you can do. It's about not doing what is traumatic to another person. So this was a, a rally that I went to um, at Wesleyan University's campus. Um, there were a bunch of them that happened in the campus center. Um, and then I decided to go someplace totally different. So I decided to go to Syracuse University, which is a large um, university in upstate New York and has um, a Division I basketball team that's incredibly popular and has the biggest Greek system basically outside of Penn State in the Northeast. Um, it's also a very cold place. I thought it was very close to New York because it was in New York, but in fact it was five hours away. So I could have gone to Ole Miss, um, I could have gone to the University of Alabama. I didn't know why I was there, but I did interview a lot of these people um, in the, you know, Sub-Zero. Um, the best thing was that a lot of the women, you know, they put on their like parkas, but then in Syracuse, you know, when you go to a party, you gotta look cool. So it would be like a parka, and then you take it off, it would just be like a, a tiny, tiny tank top. <laughs> that, was, that was what you were wearing for the night. Um, so I talked to a lot of these women um, about where the line was. So one of the um, women I went out with, she um, uses the uh, nom de plume online of blackout blonde. Hookups on Planet College are fun, blackout blonde tells me. After all, if they weren't, why would so many people have them? At a time when every type of music has been discovered and every pierced and tattooed subculture brought into the commercial fold, semi-anonymous or mostly anonymous sex with someone you barely know is a wild experience, one of the few forms of rebellion left for youth in America. At least on the surface, Blackout Blonde is pro-girl, admonishing frat brothers for being cheap and serving warm Keystone beer at parties because they know girls will dry hump each other on the speaker system no matter how little they spend on liquor. But as we talk, she does ultimately recount some experiences that belie her pro-hookup line. One time, when she was making out with a Sigma Alpha Epsilon brother in an alleyway behind a frat party, he started to squeeze and manhandle her too aggressively. She took off a heel with one hand, and she hit him on the head with it. Then she ran down the stairs. As she descended, she called a friend and yelled to the receiver, I'm like Cinderella escaping the prince. Another night had a murkier, more troubling denouement. She was hanging out with a fifth year senior, a hockey player at his house, but all she can remember is doing keg stands to a Taylor Swift song. She tells me, I was a sophomore and he was so much older and so that made me really like him and think he was really cool. But I don't really know what happened that night. In the morning she woke up in bed with him wearing his boxers. She couldn't find her clothes at first and then she looked between the mattress and the wall and saw her outfit sandwiched there. That was a weird place for her clothes to be, unless the two of them had hooked up, she thought. Clothes don't usually get smashed between a mattress and a wall, unless someone pushes them hard off the bed in the middle of sex. She tells me, the guy kept saying, don't worry. I was too drunk last night to screw Blake lively, okay? Acting all, don't flatter yourself. 
Well, A, I appreciate the comparison to Blake Lively, but B, I think he at least tried. I ask if she thinks of herself as a rape survivor. No way, she says. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one person to blame in that situation, and his name is Jose Cuervo. Okay, so this is a slide from um, Stanford University's graduation ceremony. Um, rape is rape. So, despite the passage I just read, a lot of women, um, young women on college campuses over the last few years um, have found this to be a very powerful language. Rape is rape. What to expect when you're sexually assaulted on campus? No, let's just call that rape, right? What's that word, sexual assault? I don't know what that is. People will be really upset for two whole weeks. You're more likely to be raped than stick with your major. Just because they wanted to Netflix doesn't mean you wanted to chill. People may be shocked to learn that 50% of the time, rape doesn't involve alcohol. You'll probably see your offender in the dining hall tomorrow. The problem with this was that, indeed, it wasn't always rape, right? It was sexual assault, which is non-penetrative as well. It also included things like offensive speech. This is um, a fraternity with some orientation banners out, rowdy and fun, hope your baby girl is ready for a good time, freshman daughter drop off, go ahead and drop off mom too. So I don't think any of us would say that that's not patently offensive, right? And it may even create a hostile environment for students at the school. But would we call it rape? Maybe not, right? What do we call somebody getting their butt smacked? Do we call that, do we call that person a survivor? Um, at Wesleyan, there was a boy who um, sent some pretty offensive texts to somebody one night. He also grabbed another girl and kissed her at a party when she didn't want to be kissed. Um, some students brought him up on charges. He was not allowed to walk in graduation, which is not really that big a deal. He sued the school. The school settled. So a lot of stuff began to get grouped in. And a lot of this stuff is about sexual autonomy, and it's about women putting their foot down about what is and what is not ethical, right? But using the language of rape started to get a little confusing for some people, and particularly when Rolling Stone put out this story about UVA. And I'm sure some of you are aware of this. Um, this was a story about a very violent gang rape at UVA by seven um, fraternity members in a fraternity house while a party was going on, um, a woman was taken upstairs, pushed down into a glass table, the table shattered beneath her. Um, it was implied in the piece that this was a fraternity pledge ritual. Um, this piece was quickly debunked and it really upended this conversation because now we're not talking about gradations of what sexual assault is, right? And we're not talking about sexual autonomy, we're just talking about lies. So, as I went around the country, I began talking to accused boys. And when I talked to the women on campus, particularly on liberal campuses like Wesleyan, like um, Syracuse, the students really like to talk about themselves as witches, right? Which is something that young women really usually like to talk about if they're, you know, they've got some, some uh, really radical ideas. You know, they possess not only the sorcery to upend societal orders, but they were unfairly victimized. But now we had another group, which was the accused boys who were coming in. This is a witch hunt, no different than the Salem witch trials or McCarthyism. One of them tells me, a fear has been sold to the country that every man is a potential rapist. This is now an American truth. Just the way communists infiltrating and taking over our country was a truth of McCarthyism. For our American boys today, it's guilty before innocent. 
So again, what's this conversation about? This is about women lying. And after the UVA story, this incredibly effective movement found that there was another movement. And this other movement began to really gain some purchase. And this is a movement of not only conservative and liberal attorneys, um, not only uh, people who think that due process is not being upheld in campus courts, not only men's rights activists, et cetera, but also the parents of the accused boys. Um, this is a woman from the University of uh, North Dakota. She um, is a history teacher. She's also the leader of her, uh, she was the leader of her teachers union in Fargo. And her son was accused of sexual assault at, um, at UND and the decision was overturned and he was exonerated. She began to organize. She began to organize also with a group called um, FIRE, which is the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, um, which is a group that's very interested in censorship on campus, very interested in political correctness on campus. How can we get that off campus? And um, accused boys began speaking out, usually not with their names, but this is a boy, um, Joshua Strange from Auburn University, who did come out very early with his name. And his mom told me, um, you know, Josh told me that, I said, are you Democrat or Republican? And he said, I'm a Republican because there's not a box for conservative. But he wanted to be a politician. And his mom said, Josh, if you want to be a politician, you better wear this like a three-piece suit. You better wear this story like a seersucker suit with a bow tie. And you just tell your story. Come out with it publicly. And then this happened. So suddenly we have these two movements that are really kind of going at each other, but we still all thought we were entering like the great feminist moment of our time, right? I mean, there was a woman who was about to become president. I mean, how could we possibly think that the anti-sexual assault movement on campus was going to be anything but a powerful force for change for years to come? Unfortunately, it didn't really work out that way. So I feel bad actually putting up this slide now because Betsy DeVos, you know, while I was reporting, I said, okay, Betsy DeVos and her potential grizzlies and her, you know, uh, you know, black colleges are the leaders in school choice. I mean, come on. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's so outclassed here. She can't understand all these complicated ideas. Well, we learned last week when she gave her speech at George Mason University at the Scalia Law Center that she is what people told me she is, which is she is the wealthiest, elegant, erudite, biggest religious rights supporter in America. She very much has some sense of what she's doing. Some of this may just be an act, the kind of wide-eyedness, but she doesn't want anything really to do with that radical movement. I believe she doesn't want that much to do with the broad definition. What we're really talking about here is what is the fair definition of sexual assault? What should it be? And how can we get college students to accept that and change their behavior? We'll see what she does. What we do know is that the person that she put in control of the Office for Civil Rights is Candace Jackson. She's here holding her book called Their Lives, which is about the uh, accusers of Bill Clinton. And I'm not gonna stay, stand here and say that they don't have some decent stories. Some of them do. Um, you may recall that before the Hillary and Trump debate where Trump kind of like loomed over her, there was a press conference before with the accusers of Bill Clinton. Um, Candace Jackson is kind of like a conservative Gloria Allred. She accompanied them there. Here she is with them. She's on the left sitting with them in the front row of the debate. She's also on the record telling the New York Times recently that she believes that 90% of the cases on campus are quote, we were both drunk, or quote, we were going out 
And six months later, I thought there was something about our last night of sleeping together that was just not quite right. She's also on the record talking about something very interesting, which I'll get to in a second because I forgot the slides. So, okay, so where are we now, right? We have a graduation day at Columbia University. Um, Emma did carry her mattress to graduation, even though the president sent out an email a few days before graduation saying, please do not bring large objects that could create some uncomfortability in others in the audience to the ceremony, please. She did carry it. The same day, um, some band of anonymous bandits uh, wheat pasted all over Columbia's campus this poster, which is the image from the New York Magazine cover with a very different caption of Pretty Little Liar. So Emma's case is difficult. I uh, understand that. You know, there have been some text messages that have come out between her and the boy that she calls my rapist that um, do imply that, you know, there might have been something a little bit complicated going on there. Um, so, you know, hugely controversial case. Personally, I believe her. Um, it's a personal choice in some ways. It's also a political choice for me to say I believe her. I know there's some evidence that people can use to say that, that they don't. But the movement goes on. So there's a little bit of a silver lining here, <laughs> which is that people are taking this really seriously on campus. Students really care about this issue. That's not going away. These are the little sisters and brothers of the Emma Solkowitzes of the world. They are coming to college now thinking that this is an issue that they will speak out about, that they will think about deeply. And this is a, a I'll, I'll just read some of it since it's gonna be hard to read, but this is a um, poll of a thousand recent and current college students by the Washington Post Kaiser Family Foundation. And um, this shows me that things actually really are changing on campus because this is all about consent and what these students think it is. Do you think if a person does blank, this establishes consent for more sexual activity. Nods in agreement, half say yes. Takes off their own clothes, half say yes. Gets a condom, only 40% say yes, right? As Gen Xers, that was it. There was no, you know, should I get a condom? Done, that's the decision. Now you need something more than that. Engages in foreplay such as kissing or touching, only 22% say yes. So if you start to hook up, it's not understood that you're gonna go all the way. But this is a really interesting one. Does not say no. Only 18% say that the old standard of no means no holds. The new standard is yes means yes. So this is where we are on campus today. Um, I think it's a great moment because um, as you can tell, you know, I have some complicated feelings about calling, you know, calling out stuff as rape. I understand that those labels are powerful, but I also think that they created somewhat of an intense backlash because all Americans do not agree on what sexual assault actually is. So the moment we're in now, I think is a more positive moment. Other people might say watered down, right? But it is a positive moment about talking about ethics and consent. What is it? It's a zeitgeist word, nobody has the same definition, but right now students are trying to define it for themselves, their peers, and come up with something that they feel comfortable with. So that's it, thank you. So we'll talk for a little bit, and then in a few minutes, you guys can ask questions. It's very bright, so I'm gonna <laughs> squint a little bit. Um, before I start asking a bunch of questions, I wanna say um, this book is extraordinary. It's such a good book, and I don't know, I mean, aside from the subject matter and the power of the reporting that Vanessa brings to that, um, I don't know how many of you in the room are writers, but to pair this level of reporting achievement 
with narrative writing like this is extraordinary. I mean, it's very, very unusual to <laughs> read a book that works Thanks, as well. Thanks, I really appreciate that. Um, so now I have to read it again to try to figure out how she did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very impressive. Um, I was thinking about the excess Hollywood tape, mm -hmm. which I think about all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and my experience, so everybody knows what I'm talking about, the Donald Trump excess Hollywood tape when it was um, released on October, I don't know, mid-October of 2016 that he had talked about grabbing women by the pussy. I mean, I'm just going to use language <laughs> for what it is. Yeah. I mean, our president said it, so. Um, I watched this over and over and over, and I watched it with joy in my heart because I thought it had iced the Clinton um, election. Uh, but as I watched it, I didn't think, oh, he's describing sexual assault. I thought, oh, he's vulgar. Mm -hmm. Oh, he hates women. And it took my kids, who are in their late teens, coming into the room to say, hey, he's describing sexual assault. And I think that for me, that was a really important moment in realizing that the idea of what sexual assault is has really changed since I was young, I'm 50. Um, and that I needed to be brought into this new definition. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was gonna say Candace Jackson, um, our new friend said, was um, in this New York Times, interview that was less focused on, but was really, really interesting, was when she was speaking about all these bogus cases she was coming across, she said, in most of these cases, there's not even an allegation that the young man overrode the will of the young woman. Right. Okay, so we all know that will in this scene is a very loaded word, right? Did you, did, was it physical violence or not? Was it penetration and physical violence? Because otherwise, I'm not sure I should take it so seriously. Did you resist? I mean, you might have thought we went through that like in the 70s, right? right. Women didn't have to resist for a long time, but now suddenly we might have that question back. Did you actually resist the guy? Because if you didn't, I'm not so sure I like that case either. I mean, these are, you know, kind of, ancient ideas, um, where the new idea is Donald Trump is a sexual assaulter. But we all know that that is exactly what you described, because he wouldn't be president if we all had the same understanding of sexual assault, right? He just wouldn't be. But enough people were willing to say, boys will be boys, locker room talk. Oh, these girls say that they want it. He's a celebrity, come on. So he tried to kiss her. So he stuck his hand up this girl's skirt at a nightclub. I mean, it's a nightclub. What was she doing there? What was she wearing? How short was that skirt that he felt like he wanted to put his hand there? Maybe she shouldn't have been wearing that and being at a nightclub at two o'clock in the morning, you know? So there's a real like ugliness to this when we don't call it sexual assault, right? That's the thing. But getting all, everybody on the same page is gonna be a long process. And young people definitely are changing those definitions, but how they can change their parents' minds is, is a whole other topic. But it seems like we have this whole issue with civil rights in this country where we sort of just have to wait for people to die for <laughs> generations to pass. You know, as these yeah. kids who are raised steeped in sure. this definition of mm -hmm. sexual assault mm -hmm. get older and... Yeah. It's true. I mean, look, I, I, you know, my mother started the first women's gallery in um, Soho in 1972. I grew up around radical female artists and feminists. Um, and, you know, what I see going on now um, in the pages of Cosmo, uh, in you know every women's blog from Bustle to you know some her campus. I mean, I don't even know what these blogs are, but there is so much radical thought out there. 
women, young women are reading Teen Vogue and being given ideas that are, were, were incredibly marginal a few years ago. And Teen Vogue is not doing that because they care, okay? They're doing it because it gets clicks, it sells magazines, because young students, high school, college, that is the, the philosophy. It's not just the rhetoric. It's the philosophy on life that they're interested in. We're, you know, talking a lot in this country about snowflakes and people saying they're too traumatized. And yes, it's true. Sometimes some students take it too far. But in general, it's what that student told me. Life is not about doing whatever you can do. It's about not doing what's traumatic to somebody else. They're really interested in that idea. And it's an idea of kindness, and it's not that different than the ideas of like 1969. It's not that different than, you know, love the neighbor. It's, it's really moral, moral ideas. But then how do we get it to the boys? Well, I mean, look, there's no question that lip service is being paid to the boys because, you know, I went to a lot of campuses and talked to a lot of boys. I mean, there's a lot in this book about boys' perspectives. I didn't yeah. want it to just talk to girls, even though I know tonight I really talked about that. Like, I talked to also boys who were woke and boys who called themselves male feminists and boys who said things to me like, feminism is the philosophy I found in college that made me say, like, oh, you've seen this through your life. You know, I went to Catholic school. I experienced like the worst bullying and homophobia and all of these like violent things that boys were saying to each other when I was in high school and I got to college and I said, wow, that's why that's happening. It's the patriarchy. This is incredible. I'm learning this. You know, that's like, you know, male feminists are getting made fun of on Saturday Night Live, right? Like we all have some complicated feelings about them, but they're actually... Like, this is a new step, right? To have these people as allies is a great new step because, you know, the truth is that boys can change other boys' minds, you know, in a way that women probably just really can't. So do you think that it depends your, in terms of girls' safety, does it depend where you go? Like our- Which university? Yeah. So I dropped my child at Bennington College two <laughs> weeks ago. And I definitely had a response reading this book of, oh, well, it won't happen there because it's a liberal bastion. Yeah. Right? But that's not the story that's told in this book. Yeah. And that's not, I went to a very liberal college and there was, you know, plenty of assault there. Right. So. I you, mean, I think it's, it's look, the, the sociologists definitely haven't found trends. Like, they've studied all of these different universities. They're finding high rates of assaults at the University of Michigan and the University of Southern California and tiny, I don't know about Bennington, but, you know, Wesleyan. Like, right. tiny, tiny little schools. Um, you know, there, there's not that, be, that piece is not being put together yet. Partially people think that's because there is so much drinking going on at colleges, and this is really connected with drinking. The drinking patterns seem to be fairly similar. And also the kind of sexual acts that are going on and the way that people are hooking up in terms of meeting each other, you know, for the first time online and maybe texting a lot, you know, not, not having, like, formal dates. I mean, this is all kind of, like, cliched stuff, but this is the truth, right? It is kind of these you know, really loosey-goosey hookups where a lot of the time, like, the guy, as usual, is thinking it's going to go all the way and the girl is not really sure. And you talked a lot about how expectation is really important, how if you go to a rave or you go to a certain kind of party, you have this expectation you're going to get laid, and if that's not happening, you as a guy, I guess, mm -hmm. is the story that you talk about in the book, and if that's not happening, then you make it happen? Right. I mean, I, you know, I'm very interested in toxic masculinity in this book. You know, I um, like the studies that have come out that have shown that there are not as many serial predators on campus as we think. Um, I think that Americans have, like, a, a true issue with, like, really thinking that those people are out to get us. And there are really just cultural norms here that we need to focus on. We need to focus on teaching boys younger 
that they don't need to push to get a girl to have sex with them. That's not cool. And one real change that's happening is, um, you know, drunk slash incapacitated sex, right? The sex with a student, you know, male or female, but, you know, this is mostly being perpetrated by men, right, to women or other men. Um, sex with somebody who has beer goggles on. And obviously this is still happening in many environments, but at schools where this consciousness is raised, you know, people are starting to say, like, okay, that's not like a high-five situation that you slept with that girl who was right. so drunk she couldn't speak English. Go, go you. Like, yeah. that is actually creepy and weird, and you might even deserve to be punished for that. You know, we don't like that. That's, that's, that's not cool. Um, you know, because that type of assault is really endemic to universities because of the problems with drinking. I think that will be like really significant. If we can change that, and I think from this movement, there's no question that that might really change. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I think the, the don't rape versus don't get rape, mm -hmm. it, raped is the really important idea. It's bringing boys in mm -hmm. to this conversation. And I was talking before we came in about how boys, maybe it would be helpful if all boys would just be terrified of getting, you know, convicted or thrown off right. campus. But also maybe, like as you're talking, maybe there needs to be more of a, um, a shame culture around those kinds right. of behaviors. You know, it's a peer pressure yeah. thing. I mean, I've thought a lot about it, you know, particularly because, you know, Betsy DeVos and others are talking about the problems with the campus courts, which again, I don't totally know that they're not misleading us on can some you, of that. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction between campus courts and the yes. way that rape is tried off campus? So, okay, so uh, a very basic question is why are, why are the campus courts handling this? Why isn't the police handling this? So the police are not involved generally for a few like very fundamental reasons. One is that the police and district attorneys have shown really just, they just don't have a great track record, right? With dealing with cases where there isn't physical violence, there isn't evidence. What do they want with these cases? There's no evidence. And remember, there's, the boy has a great defense. She wanted it. It's the consent defense. And that's a real problem. So, there's this nice half step, right, which is a campus court. And not only can you go to the campus court with scenarios that may be, you know, what not everybody considers to be rape, you could go to that campus court because by the student conduct code, that person has violated the student conduct code and thereby can be punished by the campus court. But under Obama, I mean, universities were already doing this, but under Obama, almost all universities changed their standard of proof from a standard of proof that was like clear and convincing, 75% sure, we're sure the boy did it, to it's more likely than not, called the preponderance of the evidence. So it's 51% likely that this boy did this. I do support that standard because these cases are really hard to prove. And actually coming up with that extra 1% is much harder than you think. So I actually think it's a fine standard, but this is particularly what's at issue. It is very clear that Betsy DeVos is going to change that standard back to the 75%. For, for campus courts. For campus courts. And she also doesn't want them to be on campus anymore. She has some idea that she hasn't really elaborated on, but there would be regional centers, and that regional center for the state of Washington would handle all of the campus matters. So be taken out of the school, brought to the regional center, but the question is who is going to be controlling it from there? Because if it's former cops and prosecutors who are only interested in evidence, then we're going to lose all of the strides that have been made to say Donald Trump is a sexual assaulter. To say if Donald Trump was in school right now, he would be expelled unquestionably. Hmm. So does Betsy DeVos think he should be expelled? I mean, I don't think that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't. Right. Um, I feel like a lot of the conversation comes around to false accusations 
and this idea that girls are lying and do we believe what girls say and are girls just a bunch of whiners. Right. And I don't really know what, I'm, what my question is, but I'm fascinated by the way that's for among right. adults, among right. people of my generation, sure. that's the conversation sure. that happens. Always yeah. around the girls. I mean, look, it's, you know, it is something that is talked about among, you know, women and men uh, in their 40s and 50s and maybe even 60s, this idea that um, there's an oversensitivity, right, by these college students today. And part of it is this idea that girls are making mountains out of molehills, right? So while enlightened Gen Xers may say, well, I totally agree that sexual autonomy is a really good thing and Donald Trump is a sexual assaulter, they also in the same breath say, but these girls are just so sensitive. Right. College it's students today, so annoying. It's almost know? like they take it personally. They take it, it really they personally. Feel, they seem <laughs> affronted by these girls' They're radicalism so because affronted. it's not their radicalism. Yeah, it's not their radicalism and it is, you know, it is something where they're coming for us, right? This is a new generation. They're coming for us. They got a new set of stuff to say, and it's not our stuff, and we're getting old, and we're gonna die. You know, like, I mean, I think it's <laughs> not like that far from that, you know? But um, yeah, I mean, look, the question of lying, you know, I have obviously like thought about this a lot in the last week, um, particularly because The Atlantic has made a real push to put out a three-part series saying like, maybe Betsy DeVos is right, and maybe this campus court has just been like a terrible idea, and like, we need to go back to the way it was. And I just, I don't understand this concept of lying, because when I look at the actual cases, what I find are not the UVA case with Rolling Stone. They are not cases that are made up out of whole cloth or even semi whole cloth or even a tiny piece of cloth. They are cases about consent and whether it was there or it wasn't. And what it means when you're in a sexual situation and you wanna leave the room and you say, I wanna leave the room and you go to the door and the guy stands against the door and says, don't leave so soon, and then kisses you, and then pulls you back, and then kisses you again, and you try to leave. And you know, that goes on for five or 10 minutes. I mean, is that cool the way that guy is acting? No, that's not cool. I mean, that is the example that was given by the Atlantic as something that is not sexual assault, right? Where a boy, innocent boy was being railroaded and having his life destroyed. And, you know, I don't want to be cold about it, but to me, you know, that is a case where I don't really care about the individual. I care about the social norm exactly. that is being changed. I care about the group rights there and what is the actual thing we're trying to accomplish. And it's true, you know, you can feel some sympathy for a boy like that. I will say, you know, and this is controversial, but I will say that, I would say let's give that boy a lower penalty. Let's not kick him out of school and ruin his entire life. He's gonna lose his scholarship. He's gonna be humiliated in front of his family. What if we say, okay, what you did, that's, that, you know, that is sexual assault, you, you definitely, that woman said I wanna leave, right? That she said no, essentially, is what that is. Um, you proceeded, you know, it wasn't uh, intercourse, it was kissing. Um, we believe in re-educating you. We don't believe in throwing you out of the university so that you can spend your time on men's rights websites and decide that you know, you hate all women and you're off to join the military now. I mean, this is really what's happening. Like, the accused boys that I talked to, they weren't talking about due process. They were talking about how much they hated women. Right. So if you make the, st if you make the punishment a little bit less and then you have this opportunity for it to be practiced in a more widespread manner, mm -hmm. then you have this chance to actually change the culture. Right. I, I really believe that. I mean, this is culture change, and that's what like Obama and Biden, 
said, we, you know, if you want to change the culture, let's do it on campuses first. And Milo Yiannopoulos is going to Berkeley, and Steve Bannon is going to Berkeley, and they say, you know, politics is downstream from culture. We're going to go get in there on those college campuses because, and Milo said this, if you win college campuses, you win. So I, I think we should open it up to the audience, but I do have one more question for you, and it's something that really nagged at me as I was reading. <laughs> I'm getting a little anxious getting ready to ask question. you. question. <laughs> uh, um, I did think a lot about how in our current um, more misogynist culture, women are the ones who've borne the brunt of humiliation, shame, violence, death, and that's been sort of the egg that's been broken to make the omelet that is our shitty misogynist world. Right. If we want to make a new world that is more supportive of women and a few boys' lives get destroyed along the way, is that a bad thing? And I'm asking that as the mother of a son and a daughter. I mean, I really am wondering yeah. about this. Your book really brought that question to the forefront of my mind, and I don't know the answer. Yeah but it nagged at me. Yeah, I don't know the answer either. I mean, I do, I, I will say that like when you think of the numbers, again, this is group rights versus individual rights right. in some ways, you know, if you think of, you know, the many, many millions of boys who are in college, you know, a teeny, tiny percentage are being brought up on charges. What usually happens is women don't tell anybody, right? Or they tell their best friends. They don't bring them to the administrative office. This is very rare, you know. Are those boys rights? And remember, some of them are guilty, right? right? Are some of those boys who either don't understand the new standard of consent, who have been schooled in the toxic masculinity of our culture, now there's a new standard, they don't know what's going on, you know, some cases, there are some cases where women are also not telling the truth, let's be honest. There are cases like that. People lie about everything. This may be one of them, too. There are a small number of cases like that, but those boys may be unjustly punished. Do we care about those very, that handful, more than we care about, you know, one in five, if you want to use a one in ten number, you know, I'm willing to debate those statistics within reason within reason goes to maybe one in 14, like women assault, sexually assaulted on That's college campus. Right. So who, who, who's, you know, whose like rights are more important? And, you know, Betsy DeVos has very clearly said that she thinks the boys' rights are more important. And, you know, there are people who are agreeing with her just on the idea that like we are not a fascist country and we say that one innocent man should walk free versus, you know, a hundred guilty be punished. And if there are some innocent men in the middle of that, then we gotta be really, really careful. Right. Um, and that resonates, you know? It's a really, it's, I mean, this is obviously where the country is in this discussion because it is so hard to answer that question. Yeah. Well, good, mm -hmm. I'm glad it's Thanks. not just you. Should we open it up to yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, and uh, as I said before, try and keep your question brief and in the form of a question so that we can get through as much as possible. Uh, so folks can come on up. I actually have a question myself. If I, I can take curator prerogative and kick it off. Mm -hmm. Something that I've thought a lot about is this sort of new um, movement, campus movement has coincided in youth politics also with the Black, Black, Black Lives Matter movement in an interesting way where a lot of young activists in town hall has hosted many events around this are sort of thinking critically in different ways about the police state and the carceral state and punitive mm -hmm. politics and thinking a lot about restorative justice and other ways to think about justice. And I think that there's probably a relationship between this new better world and mm -hmm. those politics coming to sort of greater fruition. Right. So I'm wondering if in your research there's any great examples of restorative justice processes, restorative justice yeah. ethics that have been implemented right. in these situations right. that we can point to. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the universities have really been discouraged by the Office for Civil Rights to use anything like that that's restorative justice. And the um, thought process on the Obama side was that um, whenever you give somebody who's gone through a trauma 
like a, a, a lower kind of way, you know, a, a way of dealing with that trauma that it seems like less of a pain, they're probably gonna take that one, right? There's actually very few people who say like, I wanna prosecute in criminal court, and I wanna go through this for three years, and I wanna not be really sure if I'm gonna get justice in the end. Like, much more often they'll say like, oh, that restorative justice thing, that sounds pretty good. UVA actually, during the whole Rolling Stone scandal, was actually under investigation for doing an informal process. They were having students come in who were saying they had been sexually assaulted, and they would say, listen, we could take your case to the cops, nothing will probably happen. We can take the case to the campus court, that's gonna be a real pain for you, everybody's gonna know about it on campus, you might not like that. We could deal with this informally, but just deal with it informally. You know, and um, so I think that restorative justice is the way to go. Even what you were saying before, the shaming, I mean, I thought a lot about this and I was like, maybe the answer is just writing the guy's name on the bathroom wall and shaming him in front of everybody on campus. Like, maybe that is part of the answer. It's, I mean, punishment is so complicated, you know? Um, so I think the jury's out on that. But I, yeah, I would love to hear more about restorative justice. So, so sort of two questions, just to follow up on the shaming thing. I know that at a couple of campuses, they do actually have these informal, uh, like listservs, I guess that dates yeah. me, where the women list the known predators. Right. And it's always the same guys. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something about that, at least it just protects um, girls. I just dropped my daughter off as a freshman as well, and the very first orientation, they did a sexual consent um, thing. Mm -hmm. So, which I thought was at least a beginning, but it's a small, incredibly liberal arts college. So, my question is, as a mom, what do I say to my daughter? Um, as she's, I mean, again, she's a smart kid, et cetera, et cetera, but how do I navigate that territory of trying to help guide her as she makes some really complicated decisions? Right. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's important for parents to remember, like, this doesn't happen all the time. It's not around every corner. Not everybody is bad. You know, don't let the fear kind of overtake you. Um, but I also think that, you know, A, you can talk to kids very easily if you talk to them about these new consent standards. If you look in the student conduct code for your university where your kid is enrolled, you may find that they have this yes means yes standard because it is the standard at the majority of universities today. And that, I think, is a very easy way of talking about sex and sexual assault with kids, just to say, like, I want you to read this. You're going to college now. This is what you're going to be held to. Read this, and let's talk about what it means. Let's talk about what yes means yes really means. And let's talk about, like, you setting in your own mind what your boundary is when you go out for the night. You know, what is my boundary? If I see this guy, what am I willing to do? Am I gonna go home with him? If I go home with him, do I only wanna go to second base? Do I wanna do this? Because you know, people who study this have really found that that can be really clarifying for girls. That if they think ahead of time about what they are willing to do in the abstract, they won't be so quick to say like, okay, well, I guess this guy wants to do this and he wants to go all the way and I don't really want to, but I, feel kind of rude and weird saying no, and you know, I want to satisfy him, and I, I, I feel like I'll just get it over with, you know? So the other issue is the alcohol issue, which I believe has to come into the discussion, um, although there are a lot of people who think it shouldn't. Um, you know, without blaming anybody, I think we can talk about the fact that Sexual assault does happen more when a woman has had nine drinks, which is an enormous amount of alcohol. Most women would be in a blackout or almost passing out from that amount of alcohol. And to tell daughters, like, if you are okay with saying drink in moderation, you know, drink in moderation, but be aware that if you get out of control, it's 
not like you bear responsibility for your actions then. It's like if you get out of control, you're entering a dangerous situation. There is nothing that is safe about passing out at an off-campus apartment with a bunch of guys you don't know. I'm sorry. It's not safe. Like, <laughs> I mean, things are not going to be great from there. Like, I mean, hopefully nothing will happen, but, you know, you have a hell of a lot, a bit bigger chance of something happening if you do something like that. Um, so I asked this question because I hear you say we have to get men to convince men to change the culture because women can't convince men. And I think there's validity to that. So I wonder why, and I also realize there's a statistic that perpetrators are a majority men and victims and survivors are a majority women. Um, but, you know, I see the issue that we're dealing with as like polarizing the men and women sure. and yeah. that if we... Um, want to get men to convince other men of a different culture. It's about bringing people together in two groups. So I wonder why you choose the language more often as men and women as opposed to um, victim and perpetrator or... Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I certainly um, would have written several chapters <laughs> about... Um, male-on-male -male sexual assault, about the way that gender is being redefined in the country to not be two genders, but all genders, about the way that young people are thinking about their sexuality as much more fluid and on a spectrum. Um, all that stuff is totally fascinating to me, and it is very much connected to the concept of consent and sexual assault, right? Um, but to be frank, like, there is a lot of policy in this book, and I just... There was just a lot, a lot to do. And the basic concept of the book is a toxic uh, cultural norms around masculinity and femininity, which is why I then chose to focus on heterosexual sex, although there are many people in this book who are not exclusively heterosexual. I did focus on sex and sexual assault happening between in heterosexual hookups. Um, and as I say, like, you know, I, I do think that those same cultural norms come into play in a really deep psychological way when people who are not, you know, in those heterosexual hookups, like that is also at play, but it was almost like beyond the scope of what I was going to do. Um, you know, again, like, a little controversial, but, you know, I am in line with the sociologists who I believe have the best data to date on this, although there's a lot of, you know, emerging research on, like, queer assault um, and lesbian assault, you know, the research to date that's good pretty much shows, like, the problem is anybody who sleeps with a man. It's a man or it's a woman, but it's anybody who sleeps with a man. Um, and so that's kind of where I shook out on it. Hi, um, can you just describe like the three takeaway points from the book and why, uh, and so that's question <laughs> okay. one, and then my second question is, um, what, what you think the book or, why you're the person that you feel like is appropriate to write this book or what, what you think this book adds to the existing sure. conversation. Sure, okay. I'm going to try to think of them. Um, so, you know, I wrote this book mostly because um, I have written a lot about uh, young women and sexuality. I've written a lot about pop culture. I've written a lot about... Um, you know, famous female pop stars is really how I made my living for many years, writing um, profiles of like Katy Perry or Taylor Swift or Nicki Minaj or all of these women who really are influencing young women in terms of the way that they think about their sexuality. Um, you know, as I said, also my mom is like kind of an OG feminist. Um, so when I saw this movement start to happen, I started to think to myself, like, you know, I'm really interested in main, like what bubbles up into the mainstream. And I thought, like, there's no way that this is not going to go huge. This is going to be massive. And this is going to 
make like mainstream Americans reckon with really for almost the first time, like the young female experience of sex, sexuality, and sexual assault. So that's why I wrote it. Um, you know, in the course of doing this book, um, one of my very good friends was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. So I certainly have some very um, serious feelings about um, predation and about, um, you know, those staying away from certain people. And, and I, I did, uh, you know, focus in this book on, on you know, the, the normal guy and how the normal guy moves through college and how we can deal with the normal guy. Um, but I do believe there are some bad people out there too. Um, so what, it, what are the three takeaways? I mean, the three takeaways, let me think for a second. I mean, I would say that, you know, you learn from this book. I mean, you could say you learn what like a 40 plus year old feels like going back to college. But I mean, I think you can really read this book if you're a bit older and get like an anthropological look at what college is like today in the most kaleidoscopic fashion ever because, you know, I went back there, I used my babysitter's ID because she was 24 because I figured if I showed everybody that I was 43, they were going to be like, this is the worst fake ID ever. You're not coming into this party. <laughs> so, you know, I really went to the parties and I really talked to kids and reported in a way that, you know, really no adult does. Like, this wasn't just like, hey, I'm going to stop you for a second out side of the campus center. Um, so there's like a gonzo journalistic aspect that I think will really like key people into what college is like. The second thing would probably be like you will learn what the new definition of sexual assault is, what those rules are on campus that people are being asked to abide by. And the third thing is, is that you learn about the whole political landscape. So, you know, the book is really like formatted as like a narrative, not only of my story, going out to colleges and trying to understand this issue myself, but also the arc of what I described tonight. So 2014, all the way through 2017, um, how has this issue evolved and developed and been politicized? And who's on what side? And where is it going? My heart's pounding because there's so many dots to connect here. Um, I was groomed by my seventh grade teacher and there were five other, six other girls who were sleeping with their seventh grade teachers. Eight, I mean, I'm your age, Claire, and it was common. And I'm wondering um, when you look at um, how women derive their worth by virtue of how appealing they are to men. So many, um, I, I think Ariel Levy, is that how you pronounce her Levy. last name? Levy. Yeah. Her Feminist Chauvinist Pigs mm -hmm. book dovetails really nicely with your work here. And I'm, I don't even really know how to articulate my question other than um, how do you see, and maybe this is a question for you as well, Claire, what is it gonna take for women our age to tell our stories so that we can see how this is a continuum all the way back to the thorn birds, all the way back to the stories that, it, where it's sexy to be taken. Mm -hmm. How do we reframe women's worth mm -hmm. outside of how worthy we are to be fucked by men? Mm -hmm. oh. You can take that know. one. <laughs> Yeah. I think naming it is really important. I mean, in my own work, that's what I just wrote a book about, is acknowledging the power of that validation from men and trying to somehow, using that acknowledgement as a way to push past it. So I think a lot of it for me is, you know, as feminists, we some feminists often pretend that that part doesn't exist, the part where you seek male validation. For me, I felt it was really important to write that story. So, I don't know, tell the truth, I guess, would be the first thing, which is sort of a circular answer, but so be it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think you're right. Like, I think telling the truth, but also, again, drawing the boundaries and saying that, you know, that may be part of the story, but it doesn't need to be the whole story. And the amount of, like, self-confidence that young women have gotten now, you know, at a time when they are really highly sexualized, right? When they're almost creating themselves as pinups on um, Instagram, you know, I had young women who are feminists say to me, like, you know, I sit in the dining hall and I feel like if I am not, haven't had an orgasm, like I'm in this conversation, I feel like I'm a baby. Like I'm pretending to be this sexual person that I'm not really, you know? I feel like to be a good feminist means I have to have like a threesome, you know? Like I have to really do these sexual, you know, if I am for free expression, I should free the nipple and get in that, you know, get in that uh, march. like. These are complicated things that women are, young women are dealing with. Um, and there's no way to not see the movement of sexual assault also as part of that, as part of that complicated, like, dialectic dance there, you know? Yeah, I, I think that that's very true. And I think the broadened, the broadened definition of what assault is is really important. So, yes, of course, middle schoolers having relationships with their teachers was very... I won't say very normal in the 70s, but was my experience as well. That definition, now that would be considered assault and rape in a way it wasn't then. And so I think that's important, those yeah. boundaries. Yeah. It was a very powerful question to end on. Thank you so much for the question. <laughs> yeah, and thank, thank you. you so much, thank Vanessa Gregoriadis and Claire Dieter. Uh, copies of Blurred Lines are available right out there from Third Place Book. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you at more town hall programs up here and around town this next year.